the Jewish people went through a violent period about 3,000 years ago under King David, where we killed thousands of people. And then we got through that and we became quite peaceful you know, following that. The Christians went through the crusade era a thousand years ago, uh, killed hundreds of thousands of people, uh, and they pretty much got through it, although I don't quite know how to classify the Holocaust. Um, and now the Muslims are going through their crusade period, um, which they call jihad. Um, and they have the potential to kill hundreds of millions of people because the toys have got a bit more sophisticated. If you go through all the different human rights, you'll find that the, the root of them was in the Torah. You need a boundary to first figure out who you are. We are autonomous, meaning that, you know, one Jew, two opinions is, is not just, you know, a saying. It's absolutely true. If you want diversity, um, you, you, you speak to Jews because Jews have, are, are able to have multiple uh, understandings on multiple levels. What they've done by getting rid of Jews is basically get rid of the diversity. So we've got five years of pain, but basically we've got a very rosy future. What's ahead of five us. years, you know? Uh... <laughs> the Jews saw them all, beat them all, and is now what he always was. All things are mortal but the Jew. All other forces pass, but he remains. What is the secret of his immortality? Welcome to the Jew Function, where we work day in, day out to find the solution to anti-Semitism, to Jew hatred, where Seth and I believe that we have, through rigorous uh, investigation, of historic patterns, of uh, quotes from Jewish sages, uh, of network science. Uh, after looking at all those things and all the compelling evidence, we believe that we have seen the light and we found uh, that the anti-Semitism is, is rooted uh, essentially in Jewish disunity. And when we turn against each other, that is always the hallmark of an impending calamity. And, when we looked at history, that's all we saw. And the events of October 7th, unfortunately, uh, or maybe fortunately, I don't know, depending how you look at it, they reinforce this theory, you know, so much more. So we um, are extremely anxious to get everyone to talk about it, to consider this, and to think what can we do to resume our uh, role in the system of humanity, start uniting, start being good brothers to each other i guess uh, yeah, what, is, um, what is this israel what is this nation what is this what's special about it and how is it that what happens in this one little place is a microcosm of what happens in the whole world there's a focus now on on borders and we can look everywhere in the world like you know where are what what does it mean why do we need in the the messianic vision is there are no borders we're all one family there's no reason to be protected from anyone because it, it actually to reach that state that kind of messianic state or, or something like that whatever you can envision as the best possible thing everyone needs to be helping each other that that's what is on the other side of the equal sign of, of that state is that each one helping each other creates such a thing but until that it's foolish to say that there are no borders that everything is one and everything's it's, a, it's not and in fact there needs to be certain definitions in that. and how do we sort these things how do we sort is there right and wrong is there light and darkness and not just throw a you know mush at our faces and say there's no difference between anything because that's how it's supposed to be you know that's how it was at the beginning or that's how it's supposed to be in the end but here we are stuck in the middle and it's up to us to sort all these things out and understand we don't need to start with billions of people right here in with this small group of people if we can do the sorting with us we see that it spreads to the whole network and you know what the, the funny thing is uh, just this morning I mean, literally my morning, I had a conversation with a guy in San Francisco, a young guy who was, you know, he's a computer programmer, but he's, he's in the wrong job. Um, uh, and he's, uh, he says it, and, but he's looking for this also this, you know, what's going on and what's, what's happening with, the, with this Jewish soul. Like, where is that? What's going on? He's got all these questions. We started to talk about things and I tell him about our, 
our work and, and our investigation and everything and all the sources that we use. And with today's conversation, this is like the third time we're talking for a long time. And the whole conversation was exactly around boundaries and borders that you need to have a boundary. And in fact, that's the that's like the basic uh, definition of an independent creature is that they have a boundary. There's like, I, I restrict, I keep out everything that is not me to first define what is me. And only after I do that, I can start this negotiation process with the, mm-hmm. the environment you know what and we see like the u.s border now there's millions of people come millions of illegals coming over there's israel you had the, the issue on october 7th around the border even even gender now like it's not clear like what is what is anything everything because is so confusing you need, bo- you need the boundary to first figure out who you are really what is your who is this what is this unique uh place that you occupy in the system what is your unique function as we say what is the root of your soul if you will there is a reason why you is you right and and you look different you sound different and even two twins eventually they have different uh they have different uh, um, uh, fingerprints and, and other markers that separate them right if two things were really as one they would be one so there's a reason we're different and we need that. So first let's understand who we are and then start to maybe right, make contact with, with other things around us. And uh, I think, um, I think uh, the, the nice thing about this is that also here on the show, we don't, just, we don't just limit ourselves to certain type of people. We, we kind of, I feel like we're fairly confident about what we're after and who we are in this, right? We're not, this group or that group, we're who we are, concerned citizens, right? Uh, I'm in Israel, you're in the US, and we know who we are, but now we're very confident about bringing in people who may even think and speak completely opposite. We brought here white nationalists, anti-Semites, we bring religious people, orthodox people, uh, hippies, um, writers, even politicians, God forbid. So <laughs> we, we bring everyone. So uh, I'm you know, every and every time we have a guest, it's um, it really is a, an adventure, an exploration because you, at the end of the day, you get to meet another person, uh, another maybe another part of you. So I'm very, um, I'm very uh, honored, really, and inspired to uh, bring our next guest. He's um, he's a very interesting person. He's got an interesting story, by the way, and I encourage people to listen to his story because I don't know how much time we're going to spend on his personal story because we want to have this conversation about the bigger topic at hand but he is a uh, he's a he was used to be a, a director at a private equity in london uh, and also had a master's in chemical engineering right so he's, he's he came from that then he with the help of his wife uh he received i mean with the encouragement of his wife because I, I listened to him in another podcast he received his rabbinical ordination uh, from Rabbi Shlomo Risking at Yeshivat uh, Hamivtar in Israel, and he served as a rabbi in the UK. And then they moved to Israel. But in in uh, April uh, of last year, April seventh of last year, uh, his life changed completely when his wife Lucy and, their, and his two children Maya and Rina were murdered by a Palestinian terrorist during Passover. And since then, he became an inspirational public speaker and, and a special envoy for social initiatives by uh, the Israel's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And he also wrote a book, Transforming, Transforming the World, which was republished in English and Hebrew, dedicated to the memory of his wife and daughters. So I want to welcome Rabbi Leo D. Uh, to the Jew Function. Hello, sir. Uh, hi, Seth and uh, Leo. Nice hi. to be here. Nice to have you here. Um, I don't even know where to begin. Um, Seth, do you have an opening question? Yeah, I I heard, not an opening question, I heard you on a podcast, a POV, I think it's called. Yeah, with Dr. Ozzy, that's how we, we met, she's uh, a, a friend. Yeah, I was really um, surprised by your um, opinions and by some of the things you say, maybe it says, you know, Leo and I definitely have some unique opinions and you can't just go talk. I mean, right away when you kind of start saying our opinions, some people immediately think we're anti-Semites because we're saying the Jews have something to do with anti-Semitism, not, not, you know, that we have some responsibility in the whole thing. Um, So we're used to 
which if you just hang around long enough, you'll see that's, you know, obviously we're not anti-Semites, <laughs> both very proud Jews, and we want to bring unity and love to everyone. Uh, but we just want, we just don't see, uh, you know, if you're sick and you just keep taking a pill instead of uh, getting to the root of the issue. So uh, we think there's a problem with that. We, we're realists, basically. We see that stuff is not working. Uh, you know, the, the, the way we've been fighting Jewish hatred has simply has not panned out as we, you know, we yeah. wanted to. So we're so, just so, asking questions. So some of the things that I heard you say, though, you know, you, you almost, I almost made me cringe as, as a nor as a Jew from the Northeast in the United States, you know, you, you know, that, 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 uh, Israel needs to be a parent, but, but here's the thing that surprised me in not, it's not aggressive in any way. It's very matter of fact, but it's like when you're, you're talking about, um, children, there's, it's not like they're out to get me. It's just, no, I know what's better and that's how it is. And my thought was, what gives you the confidence that your point of view on that, for example, the Jewish, that, that, that the, the Muslims should adopt our understanding of peace or our understanding of, uh, of how a modern world should be. Why is that better than, than theirs? Uh, great question, Seth. Um, look, uh, what, one way of looking at it, uh, which, which I always refer to is that <clears throat> We, the Jewish people went through a violent period about 3,000 years ago under King David, where we killed thousands of people. And then we got through that, and we became quite peaceful you know, following that. The Christians went through the Crusade era 1,000 years ago, uh, killed hundreds of thousands of people, uh, and they pretty much got through it, although I don't quite know how to classify the Holocaust. Um, and now the Muslims are going through their Crusade period, um, which they call Jihad. Um, and they have the potential to kill hundreds of millions of people because the toys have got a bit more sophisticated. And I think that it is the duty of everybody else, but I, I think you know one has to take it upon oneself as, as you know, the Jews to get them through this phase uh, very quickly because um, we don't have the hundred years that uh, the uh, crusade took and we don't have the hundreds of years really that, uh, that, that took uh, us the time of King David, but there's, actually, there's a, phenom there's a phenomenon yeah. in New Jersey, though. Maybe it's in other places where, like, when when we moved to town, we wanted the building department to allow us to build our house. But now that we're here, we want the building department to not let anyone else come and develop the green land. We want them to keep them out, right? Like, we don't want the the region to be too built up. We, we want it, you know, it doesn't, isn't each person kind of like that. It's like, like we had our jihad, the Christians had their jihad. So let them have their jihad. You know, why, why now that we got what we want, should we say like, you know, they want what they want too. And so it's bigger. Well, everything's bigger in the modern times. So again, what is the, where is I, I, your confidence and justification for saying No. I think I mean it's interesting. In my, in my book, I, I address this. I, I talk about how uh, Jews effectively created the modern Western civilization, um, and I justify that in a way because um, you know if if you look at uh, what are human rights, which really define the Western civilizations, um, they're basically Jewish values. They come from one place, and that's the Torah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we talk about freedom of religion. Uh, freedom is a concept that comes from the Torah, right? Uh, Martin Luther King, when he refers to freedom, he talks about uh, let my people go, because the archetypal story of freedom is from our, our book. Um, religion, you know, that's a word that comes from the Torah. Um, you know, I used to be a, a community, community rabbi in England. We'd have non-Jewish people come and visit Christians and Muslims. And I'd show them the synagogue. I'd show them the uh, the ark and the uh, and the set out. I'd say, you know, this is modeled on the uh, the tabernacle in the temp in, in the desert. Um, and of course, the church is modeled on the synagogue and the mosque has been modeled on the church. So basically, it all comes from the same core, which is absolutely mm -hmm. true, right? Um, so religion, because the so freedom of religion comes from us. Uh, what about equality, men and women? So the, the Torah tells us that the man and woman were created simultaneously. Um, so, you know, there isn't a greater description of equality between man and women um, than you have in the Torah. And of course, Sarah is a better prophetess than Abraham's a prophet. Uh, Rebecca is a better prophetess than her husband, Isaac. Uh, Esther is greater than Mordechai. 
Um, you know, so we see um, this balance uh, in in our Bible, and that's uh, had its impact on mankind as well. So, so if you go through all the different human rights, you'll find that the the root of them was in the Torah, and um, it took us two thousand years really to influence uh, the Western world. Um, but it was very much adopted, and and I don't. But think I want to I want to I want to push you deeper on that. Then, mm. so why is it better? that a woman should be free, for example, and not subservient to her man. Like, I just want to oh. understand where you're okay. getting the authority okay. to say this. And so, so that's, that's great. So, so, I mean, that, that's a beautiful question. I think it also is a contrast between us perhaps and the Muslim world where uh, equality doesn't exist in quite the same way. So in my book, I talk about the, uh, the need for equality between man and woman. And I took that in a slightly different way to perhaps a uh, way that people normally discuss it. But I said that, look, um, who can criticize you, right? Um, your parents basically will not criticize you, that you know, you're still a little kid and whatever you do, however bad it is, they'll still love you and uh, and tell you how wonderful you are. Your siblings will probably, you know, they don't have to spend too much time with you at this age. So whatever you do, they'll probably just, you know, see you two, three times a year and, and also tell you how wonderful you are. Your friends, you know, if you upset your friends, then they may leave you and that they won't be friends anymore, right? So it's, it's the, the wife. Per- the, the answer is the wife, right? <laughs> the, only, the, only, the only person, the only person who can actually uh, criticize you um, and, and tell you the truth uh, and will tell you the truth is your is your your spouse, because it's in their interest. They're stuck with you for life, hopefully, and um, they don't want you to keep doing whatever it is, which is really annoying them and presumably everybody else. So, so your your spouse becomes this amazing. Um, a person who can help you become the you that you should be, right? That that ultimately is what happens. So, so if you want to make the world a better place, and my book is about transforming the world, but yeah, then actually this is one of the stages: is is, is getting married um, to somebody for life, or with the intention of it being for life, and actually um, taking their feedback. Uh, and it works both ways. Um, this could be an amazing tool for self improvement, you know, both both directions. So yes, I think that if you look at the Muslim world, and you look at how, um, in many ways, it is stuck in the Middle Ages. Part of that lack of uh, development is the fact that women have not been uh, empowered, and even if they're educated, they're not empowered. So the the marriage uh, contract, which gives the woman security in the case of divorce or death of the husband actually gives her power in that relationship. Um, in cultures where you don't have that protection for the woman, the husband basically can uh, treat her like a rag and she can't go anywhere because she can't so get I, anything. I agree and I'm inspired by what you're saying. I still want to know where do you get the authority to say that that's better than an imam who's saying that another way is better. Or, oh, hold on, yeah. or even a more difficult question, why nevertheless we see the appeal of this way of life with people, I'm not saying with everyone collectively, we still see mm. people considering that, thinking about, c- contemplating, rooting for that, you know, despite mm. all this, uh, you know, medieval mindset, as you say. Uh, where does it come from? So look, uh, there are many different ways of looking at this, um, but I would say that um, if you look at Pew reports consistently, the Jews are one of the most successful groups in America, for example. Um, uh, economically, I think if you look at the happiness level of Israel as a country, it is you know, t- typically very much in the top 10 uh, on an annual basis. Um, if you look at uh, the annual income, if you look at uh, natural holiday days, if you look at the family size, if you look at, I mean, I'd say the, on many different uh, actual physical metrics, you could measure Jews and say, uh, we're doing better than the Muslims. Um, you know, you, you only have to walk into Iran today and see gays being thrown off roofs and women being covered from head to toe. You only have to walk into Syria and see that they've just killed half a million people and nobody really cares and nobody notices. Uh, you have to walk into, you know, poor countries like pa- Pakistan where they treat uh, Afghanis like uh, um, animals. Um, and, and then you come to Israel and actually people are pre- pretty nice and there's a very good communal atmosphere in general um, and uh, and the tremendous uh, feeling of, of unity that there is now after October the 7th uh, and, and the incredible behavior of our young soldiers on the battlefront, the humane actions of the Israeli army in this current conflict, you know, all, all these things I think are amazing indicators of 
who we are and and uh, how you know we're affected by our, our i agree i love us the question yeah, is why why isn't the world loving us and, and uh, why? okay so why is the world not loving us so I, I, I yeah, so I, let's kind of I'll, bring all those things okay. back to, to the i'll, Icar, tell, you know? I'll tell you I, I i've had many arguments i think i like what you 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 guys are saying but i, I want to just uh throw something else into the mix which i had from uh, rabbi why why uh, Jacobson. I don't know if you've ever had him on the uh, program, but he's uh, he's somebody you should definitely invite because he, he's very, very strong on this particular point. Why would Jacobson? He says as follows. Um, he says, you know, th th there's a widely used proof by rabbis that the Torah is true. And they, it goes as follows. You probably heard it in, in different forms that you know, the, the, the Torah um, claims that uh, the whole Jewish people, which we estimate about two million people at Mount Sinai, um, saw God and you know, when the, the Ten Commandments were uh, were received. It's very difficult to fabricate that um, because you know, when you pass that story down from generation to generation, it, you know, it's one thing if if one person saw God, you know, then you could, you know, nobody would know. But if you're if if the Torah is claiming your great great grandparents actually saw God, then you know, if if they hadn't, it'd be pretty difficult to transmit that from generation to generation. That that's the logic. Now, I personally find that a very difficult uh, logic, and I I can find perhaps you know ways to argue with it, uh, whatever. But that's not the topic uh, of the of this uh, at the moment. Uh, what R Rabbi Jacobson says is. Um, as far as the Christians and Muslims are concerned, they believe it. That that's what we have to know. Why do they believe it? Because if you look at Christianity, um, you know their miracle um, at the end of Jesus's life when he was reincarnated uh, or when he was resurrected happened in front of a very small number of people. Um, and Muhammad, whatever happened to him, happened in front of you know a small number of people or in a dream. Um, so the revelation of God, whatever. So basically. Um, their religions depend on the fact that they're built upon our religion, that we saw God and that God came along to Jesus or to Muhammad and basically said, you're the new Jews. So that, that's the philosophy of 4, million people, 4 billion people on this planet. Now, this, is, this creates a bit of a problem because we are therefore, in their eyes, the, um, test, the, the, the witnesses of God on earth, right? Um, and therefore... Uh, when they look at us, you know, we are sort of a symbol of morality. And if people uh, want to be immoral uh, or they want to change morality, well, they have to two options. Really, they can either become more like us, which they did over the last 2000 years, um, or uh, they can kill us, which was you know, Hitler or uh, Hamas's approach, um, because it's very difficult to get away with immorality when you've got these people on earth who are, you know, who, who were the, the the witnesses of of God when He appeared here, you know, uh, three and a half thousand years ago. So right, right. Prefer, we have uh, Professor Patterson. I don't know if you know him from uh, Texas. David Patterson wrote about the metaphysical origin of anti of anti semitism, and. Uh, his, that was his book, and but and he converted to Judaism after studying everything in the Talmud. He says, "Like, oh, I, I, that's me. I, I'm, I'm one with these people." But he said that the Jew, the reason people don't like Jews is because Jews don't let other people sleep. You know, you can't remain asleep with a Jew around you. You know, morally, consciously, right? Uh, that that's the, the, the it's the, it's that quality that they're. It's like they're they're like the moral compass of the world, right? So if you do away with the moral compass. Can right. get away with anything, right? With the conscience, you can you can do it. So this is this is this long story he answers the question I was trying to squeeze out of you, which is where do you get your authority? And you get your authority because a couple million people uh, experienced God and they've been passing it down, and that's why what we have to say is is valid. Right. I, I yeah. think that 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 is you know, that's a traditional approach. I mean, um, yeah, if you if you want to look, and then you say, you know, what what makes us. Um, more right, let's say, than than some of these other religions. I, I think one of the things is the dialectic approach to religion. So, um, you know, I, and, I, and I think we saw this on October the 7th uh, or after October the 7th. Why, why do I say this? Because Jews are autonomous. And this is one of the most amazing things about the Jewish people. We are autonomous, meaning that, you know, one Jew, two opinions is, is not just, you know, a saying. It's absolutely true. If you want diversity, um, you 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 speak to Jews because Jews have are, are able to have multiple uh, understandings on multiple levels. Um, you know the world that we have at the moment, which is so polarized between you know you're either Democrat or you're Republican, you're a conservative or a Tory, you're a, you know, whatever, you're an oppressor or oppressed. You know th these concepts 
um, are not Jewish concepts because in, in, in if you study Talmud and you study Jewish uh, law, um, they're all different opinions expressed, which are opposite to each other. And you have to learn both of them. In fact, um, you know, Hillel, uh, we go according to Hillel against Shammai because Hillel always used to mention Shammai's opinion before his own. Um, in other words, you know, the, the, the greatest thing in terms of Jewish debate is to quote your opposition and to discuss it before you explain yours, right? Not, not to just trample over him and badmouth him. Um, and, and so this autonomy, the ability for Jews to, to differ quite dramatically, you know, within the same people and still be the same people um, is an amazing tool for survival because we look at what This is the life. tool. This yeah. is the tool. This is, is we're not going to wipe out everyone else on the planet and we're not going to squash them into submission until they uh, you know what what happens you you wipe out this one group and then another one pops up even stronger right. you wipe out another it's 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 endless mm -hmm. but to pass on a system a jewish system happens to be where many opinions can disagree but they're all they don't cancel each other they strengthen each other Leo, what's right. the quote that the uh, something of authors uh, create the envy of authors? Yeah, authors envy, uh, or, or uh, authors in Hebrew will, will increase. Kenat chokma, kenat sufrim tarbe chokma. Yeah, right, right. Um, so, actually, so, there was I'm sorry, there was another uh, quote, a famous quote by an Orthodox rabbi in Jerusalem. I forget his name, and it says uh, they asked him about all these uh, one group against another, and you know they issued these pashkavilim, these posters, right? They put on the wall. Don't listen to this group, or you know, beware of this. And and, and they ask him about this. Like eh, you know, those those posters they make our walls stronger. You know, the foundation strong. So it's like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's a Jewish thing. You know, yeah. that, that, that. I don't think anyone else is doing what we're doing, and uh, yeah, and that's exactly it. No, nobody can comprehend what we're talking about. How could there? How could who would even say that anti Semites are have anything valuable to say without saying we're anti Semitic or we're self hating Jews? But there's something that everybody's missing in this whole picture. And the reason why the solution is so close is because we're not waiting for anyone else to change. We're not waiting for the laws to be enacted. We're not waiting for a new politician to get elected. The answer is way closer than everybody thinks. Like us, uh, hit the, the bell thing on the YouTube so you can get a notification when, when a new episode is up. This is the Jew function, and uh, let's get back to our yeah. Guests. That's a Jewish thing, you know. Yeah, that, yeah, that, that, I mean, I, I, and going back to the Muslims and, and you know and our culture, um, I talk about peace versus um, shalom, and they're two different things. And I think that you know I think the problem is uh, if you look at the Oxford English Dictionary, uh, sh uh, shalom is translated as peace, which is it is not. Um, the way I would characterize it is as follows: that um, peace. Is like you know you you stick um, little squares into a grid. Every every square it's like a mosaic basically. Every piece has to be exactly the same square shape. It maybe could be slightly different colors, but if you want peace, everyone has to be the same, right? And that is not a Jewish form of uh, shalom, right? Shalom is a jigsaw puzzle. Every piece can be completely different shape, right? Ideally, you know, it, 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 everything is unique. Um, but they, once they fit together, um, they fit together in a, in a beautiful and they create a beautiful design. So Shalom is about taking very complicatedly different pieces together, like a jigsaw puzzle, sticking them together uh, and, and working out the framework in which they can fit. Um, and peace is about squashing everyone into the, exactly the same square yeah. shape and, and creating a, a mosaic, which is you know really not quite as beautiful. When you know, Oh, go ahead, go ahead. When you when you spoke about Abraham and Babylon, I think that's that's like where this method, this Jewish method, came. You had all these different opinions, and then so this is, it seems to us, and you know we we, we will send you uh, cash and prizes for you know being the first to no, we like we 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 got to the you know to, to, to it so quickly. It seems to us that this is the thing that we need to be doing as Jews. We need to be proudly and with. And not forcefully, I don't forcefully, but uh, is the right word, but with um, with forces spreading this method, this method of being, because I'm in here in the U.S. and the country's ready to tear itself apart. Everything is so polarized. You guys, before you know, with the with the judicial reform, everyone is willing to to, to tear tear each other apart. Mm -hmm. uh, this method of this Jewish method of of uh, having all of these differing opinions, but 
having this thing called uh, shalom that, that mm -hmm. you described it is um is you know what needs to be taught to the whole world it, it, look uh i i i couldn't agree with you more i actually uh, one of my many projects i'm working on is an english translation of the talmud um i know it's been done before and people say there are english translations nobody has actually translated it um the way that it's set out around, around the page with the uh tosafot and rashi commentaries on the side exactly set out the same way in a way that you can study it in an authentic way in english um so is it when you, possible to study the uh, so, it, so it turns out it is well, we will be releasing please god uh the first uh, book um in the next few months um, but the idea really is that people who haven't had access to this sort of Jewish form of learning, really, which is dialectic and the ability to sit together and discuss a text uh, in a you know, in a relatively sophisticated way, but in English, uh, this has not been available. So I, I think, but 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 there's something going on, Seth, I think, which um, I'm sure you're aware of and you're, you're referring to anyway, but I, you know, I've recently visited Harvard University and um, I went to the Hillel and um, it was empty. And I met with the rabbi there and I said to him, you know, so where are the students? He said, well, 20 years ago, he said 20% uh, of Harvard students were Jewish. 25% uh, 20, of the students were Jewish. Uh, and they, they were out, therefore there were around 150 religious students and this place would have been buzzing. He said, because of DEI, diversity, equity and inclusion, um, that basically was a policy of getting rid of Jews. And now they're down to 4% Jews in Harvard and there are only uh, 30 religious Jews. Um, so basically there's, there's hardly enough to really have a sort of, you know, a, like a sort of, a, a Hillel house. Um, so you're working again now, now, well, why don't I mention this? Because Harvard had a survey recently, uh, or there was a survey done on Harvard students where they showed that 96% of Harvard students are, have identical ideologies. They're all basically woke, uh, left-wing Democrat, whatever, which is, you know, which is fine, but not 96% of them, because that is just, you know, no diversity at all. So what they've done by getting rid of Jews is basically get rid of the diversity, because what they didn't realize, what they thought was, if we go to Qatar and Iran and all these places and bring these students into Harvard, which is what they've done, um, of course, we're going to have diversity because everybody's going to be different. But in fact, they all come to Harvard and they're all basically the same. Um, the Jewish you know, mentality and, 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 and way of thinking and education is such that um, you, you have two or three Jews, you've got a huge amount of diversity of, of opinion. And I think what they've done in Harvard um, is probably happening in many other universities around the world, um, is, is to actually um, to, to be misled to believe that if you have people from different countries, uh, that is diversity. Uh, and people of different religions, that's, that's diversity. It's not true. If you have people who are educated in a certain way, that is diversity. They could all be white Caucasians, they could all be black Africans. But you know, if they have a, 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 a way of looking at the world, which is diverse, then you have diversity. And if they don't, and they just have a standard, you know, cookie cutter, liberal education, then they're basically gonna be cookie cutter liberals and uh, not, uh, not diverse. <clears throat> And, and that's the opposite to the Jewish, um, you know, Judeo-Christian, let's say, uh, you know, uh, uh, perspective that that we need in the world. So I, I, I'm curious because on the one hand, uh, it sounds like Jews are sitting on something really important. Uh, and, and we talk about it also, we, uh, you know, you, you mentioned this ability to, you know, this diversity, the ability to... Um, you know, entertain opposing views in, you know, in the inside one person and also inside a group. And that by extension, you know, is, is really the, the ticket to, to, to peace, to wholeness, right? To making whole, right? With all the contradictions, everything you can, they can live together. And Seth and I basically, we say that, I mean, not, not we say, we, we found out that in a lot of places, they, they describe this quality as something that Jews had when they were all sort of working Exactly in um, in this form of love covers all crimes or all transgressions, where you really you allow for these for this friction to exist and you cover it with love, and that's how you exist, and that rev that opens up a whole a whole other dimension. It's not simply good morals and ethics. We're talking about really opening up a, a higher form of living, a higher consciousness, if you will. And Jews had it; they really had it uh, collectively. Whether or not they saw, you know, everybody saw it on, and around Mount Sinai, the, the temples were really a, a combination of that, a symbol of that 
high degree of attainment that where the entire nation lives with, with these principles and people flocked from all over to see to learn from that and uh, it's it's what gave Jews the ability to really um, kind of have a, a a systemic view of of reality really that that ability to see these and and then we we fell from that and got you know exiled and dispersed around the world and, and you see it, you see it clear with people, they don't even have to be Jewish by birth, but maybe they're descendants or some, you know, maybe their soul is descendant, if you will. They have that spiritual gene, which also allows them to see the system in this way. And you know, these people, you see them, there aren't that many of them, and they mm -hmm. see things in this way, whereas everyone else sees things, as you said, black or white, left or right, up or down, you know, it's that inability mm -hmm. to, to, to entertain, you know, a, a range and a, and a combination of things. But, but we have it. There's, mm -hmm. a, there's another element which I'd, I'd like to add as well. I think that there's an element of induction versus deduction. Um, I think Rabbi Soloveitchik talks about this, but um, there's fascinating. Um, if, if you look at how, what happened to Jews about 2,000 years ago, the Romans destroyed most of the rab rabbinical layer. Most of the, the learned Jews were destroyed, but there was you know, a thin layer left behind. Um, and basically, that was the time that the mission of them was written. Um, and a lot of um, laws were preserved, but um, people didn't know why. Um, so, you know, what happened was, you know, people remembered that this is how we did X, Y, Z, um, but they didn't quite know the reason for it, uh, which is unusual because usually, you know, um, you know, the way the knowledge grows, it, it, it's the other way around, right? You don't know the answer. But, but you, we have uh, you know, what we call the deterioration of the step by step. Yeah, until you get to the answer. We actually had the answer, but we didn't have the method. Right. So a lot of the Talmud is what it's doing is is trying to retrofit an argument to an action that we know is what we do. Um, and so it's inductive. In other words, you know, given that we, we do X and Y, what is the common logic that would lead to, to it? Why, why is this interesting? Because it's actually a sort of solution-based thinking. Technique, and I think it, it's very much behind the startup nation concept that Jews look at the you know result they want, and then they create the process to get there, right? And this is exactly Jewish learning, and right, and 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 yet you know if you if you study sciences, even um, you know I'm not talking about uh, liberal arts, but just to say sciences in university, it's deductive, right? You learn right, the rules, right. you learn the axioms, and then you because, build up. To, yeah. And you touch on this is this is perfect because you touch on the essence of. You know the whole the whole creation is the the end result is in the initial thought, right? And right, Jews, right. as Jews, we know Israel. It, I, what we learn is Yeshael, straight to the Creator. That's right, the right. quality of Israel. The people who want to reach that quality of love, bestow, call it the Creator, call it the upper force of nature, whatever you want to call it. We want to get there. Now, how do we do it? And we, and that's right. And we, and we say, ain't old, old Bill Vado, that there's nothing right. else but God. In other words, there's one thing, there's one reality, you know, the universe, I don't, they call it the universal uh, theory or whatever of reality, the ph physicists are trying to get to. The grand um, so unified theory. Which grand unified can, theory. So we, we have a grand unified theory that yeah. there is actually what, you know, there is a solution at the end of it, of yes. one solution. And we start with that premise and we're working up towards it. You know, I think if you are in the secular world, you're starting with a bunch of rules and you're moving from there. And of course, what happens is you get to many different destinations, which are very different. And then also you, you, you get stuck. You hit many yeah. walls along the way. You get, so, stuck, the you get stuck in your silo. You get stuck in your silo and there's no way to get back to the other one because you know, your, your methodology is, is, you know, is, is fixed. Um, yeah. That's, yeah. We don't have to... to convert the whole world tomorrow though you know we just also because you know leo mentioned three things uh big data network science and and the sages we historic patterns uh, sorry historic patterns when you look at uh at who we are we just need to start with ourselves and we're a really small group uh so there was obviously after um, what happened in October, a desire in the people to be willing to do this. Uh, the point is like, well, how much do we have to pay to be willing to want to do this? If we do it, it will ripple through the world. So mm -hmm. we don't have to worry about everyone else. Of course, we need to protect our borders and we need to do all these things in the meantime. but. 
the focus of that of headed towards that that goal inductive reasoning i think you, you would call that one right mm-hmm. yeah it's headed towards that is just assemble this group and the small group start real small even and get them to put this in this method into action question is without a strong kick in the ass this group is not willing to do it so right. that's a problem so that's a problem because we're, then, then we've got to kick up the ass on the 7th of October and now we're doing it. Now, I mean, as an example of how we influence the world, I'll just uh, give you a, a practical example at the moment. The British uh, defense minister, a guy called Grant Shapps, who happens to be Jewish, but that's incidental, um, spoke about four weeks ago. Um, and, incidental, um, he said, Leo, he said. <laughs> <laughs> he said. He said that um, three, there are th- that the British uh, British. Uh, People need to do three things. He says there's going to be a war with Russia and or terror states uh, in the near future. And we need more weapons. We need um, conscription and we need a change in culture. Uh, it was an amazing speech. And um, and I was listening to it. And I think to myself, you know what he's saying? He's basically saying Britain has to be more like Israel. Why? Because um, if you spend not 2% of your budget on defense weapons, but 10% like Israel does, then that means you have to cut other parts of your expense, like your healthcare. Israel has the lowest cost uh, healthcare, best quality, lowest cost healthcare in the world. So you're basically saying we have to uh, change the NHS, which is very expensive, to something much more like Israel's. Um, if you say we want conscription, um, presumably of men and women, the only democratic country, free country in the world that has conscription for men and women is Israel. So we have to become more like Israel and have conscription. And number three, we need to change in culture. What did he mean? He meant that basically if he were to call up Gen Z in uh, England today, they would say no way. Um, and how do we get to a culture where when we call people up, we don't get 100%, we get 120% like we do in Israel because people say, can I come too? Um, so effectively, in those three statements, he was saying, we need to be more like Israel. So re- Israel, you know, in their response, our response to October 7th is already um, a, a light into the nations. I, I happen to be speaking uh, to a brigadier general in a, um, the American uh, Air Force uh, two days ago on, on Zoom. And uh, he he was absolutely saying the same thing that you know that uh, America would not be able to conscript uh, people today in the same way that of Israel. Of course. Has so why? So point. so say something about that. Why in Israel are people willing to go, but in a place like the U.S., I wouldn't necessarily want my kids to go fight some war that I don't know where they're going to send them. Who who knows where they would send them and to fight for what? I don't know. So, so, so as, as Rashi says, right, that the Jewish people are one person with one heart. And I think we have, you know, a common vision of what, what we want, which is basically a safe country in which to bring up our families. So, yeah, that, that's a pretty good start. Now, if you go to a place like America, then you've got Democrats who have one vision of what they want to have and Republicans want something else. And then other countries, you always have, you know, to, and, and, and yes, in our country, in Israel, we have. 10 different political parties. But actually, if you analyze it, you know, even when they were marching against each other before October the 7th, that's you know, one side was marching with an Israeli flag and the other side was marching with an Israeli flag. But this side was saying, I want the best for my people in my country. And the other side was saying, I want the best for my people. We don't agree on how, because we're a dialectic uh, a population who have different opinions, which is great. But we agreed that, you know, we were doing it for the for our, our land. Our land but, but, our but didn't you feel, I, I know we're kind of like meandering through and I'm, I'm fine with it if you're okay, because mm. uh, every idea is, you know, the, the springboard to another idea. But th- th- didn't you feel like it was, it was uh, uh, an extreme point. It wasn't simply, I want, th- I think this is the best way. I think this is the best way. Okay, let's talk. It was, it felt to me being in Israel that it was like, I want the best thing and I'm going to have to wipe you out in the process yeah. and that's okay. Yeah. Didn't I, you feel I, that? I, think, I think it was aggressive. Look, uh, Steinzeltz, Rob Steinzeltz uh, wrote a book, uh, We Jews. And he asked the question, you know, are we a people? Are we a nation? Are we a race? He says, no, none of the above. He says, we're a family. He says, how do I know we're a family? He says, because, um, you know, if you're a part of anything else, he says, and somebody upsets you, go off and do something different. He said, but if it's your family and your brother upsets you, you fight with him tooth and nail until That's you die. Point. That's because, a point. Because you're stuck with him. He's always going to be your brother. And therefore, you know, and, and therefore and you're stuck. So but, that's, but, that, but that, that's how you started. We started the talk and you said it and, mm-hmm. and, I, and we agree. The question is, 
And the, the concern that Seth and I have is like we, we've, we've spent the last three years before October 7th, mm. three and a half years, uh, uh, listing all those instances where we stopped being like a family. We said, okay, family, shmamly, I'm out of here. Mm-hmm. Or no, you're dead. You know, or, mm-hmm. you know, like we went beyond the family, beyond like, right. even if you fight, you come back to Shabbat, you come back for the holidays, you come for when someone needs help, right? There's always the, you, you save uh, this place in your heart. Whereas so, in other countries, it's not, you know, in America, it's like, oh, I don't agree with you. I'm moving to another state. I don't even need to see you the rest of my life, right? So, if, so, so, yeah, so look, I think I think that if you go to the uh, battle uh, front today and you speak to soldiers, which I did on battle Sunday front, evening, battle yeah. front. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes, I'm saying yeah. nope, not the battle front. How can we right. get there without the battle? That's what Seth right. and I are asking. Right, right, right. right. Um, I, 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 I'm optimistic. I think. Jew function is really a. Um, it's a desperate, I guess, desperate attempt to to change something about the rise in anti-Semitism that doesn't seem to go away. And looking at history usually ends with something terrible before we reach relative quiet again. But we don't want to reach something terrible. We want to do it now. So that's why we're doing this, this podcast. And if you like this uh also consider leaving a small contribution on our Patreon channel. Right. We both have day jobs, by the way, so we're not we're not hoping to make money from this. We're we hoping to see some um, change of heart. Any funds are used to get this out there, to get this to people. We consider this the same way you go out every day to get money to feed your family, put a roof over your head. This is also critically important to our future, to our safety, to a good world, not only for Jews, but for everyone. Well, this is the Jew function, and uh, let's get back to our guest. I, I, I'm optimistic. I think that you know when these guys and girls come back from the battlefront, um, in five years' time, uh, that government will be set up by those people who work I, together, I and I have complete confidence that'll be fantastic. I have con- great concern for the next government, because it's a little bit too soon for those people to come back. And then we've got, you know, so we've got five years of pain, but basically we've got a very rosy future. What's well, five years, you know? Uh, <laughs> of so I think that um, I'm, I'm very optimistic about, you know, the, the sort of um, medium term. So speaking of time, since, you know, you, I, I didn't want to touch on that, even though it's not like, the, you know, our, our, our main issue is, is Jewish unity, because I think mm-hmm. I, we really do think that this is the thing that is, Mm-hmm. You know, most at our control, and this is the place where we. This is really a, sort of our calling. Everything mm-hmm. else, I feel, we feel, is really we're doing it just to buy ourselves time. Essentially, you know, mm-hmm. we're keeping the borders. So the, the point of the matter is not for you know just let everybody leave us alone and let us just live here. It's not the mm-hmm. you know if it were the case, we probably disappeared at, you know fifteen hundred years mm-hmm. ago. For some reason, humanity needs us. The system of nature needs us. The creator needs us. Whoever. Mm-hmm. decided that we need to be here and also you don't need to grow in numbers so much but but it's, there's a small number of you and, and you need right, you need one candle to make a lot of light right in the dark room mm-hmm. so it's just a small number but you got you guys got to do it you got to do something so assuming that there is something we have to do and we we haven't done it yet and we're only turning to that ideal when a battle is upon us mm-hmm. I'm curious to hear, uh, for everybody listening, to hear some of your thoughts on how, and I will phrase it this way, how do we buy ourselves more time here in the, you know, being where we are in the Middle East, surrounded by these uh, Arab countries and Arabs inside and, and and the United Nations around us, and it really kind of the world feels like the world is conspiring to maybe shut down the operation. How do we buy us enough time to stay here and, and actually maybe also do this work? Spread the unity. Spread the unity, get this new government, change a mindset, education, you know, rehabilitate the family, right? Like yeah. you need you need time it, for that. It's, I think it was so it, it's about education. Um and it's about inspiration. I think you guys, you know, are part part of that picture. I think that people have to be inspired to want to change. They need to understand what the vision could be as a people. I mean, I I think, you know. Uh, it's very important that people understand, Jews understand, we're not, you know, nobody would want, God forbid, um, a uniform society. 
we wouldn't want everybody to be just you know, religious in the traditional sense, or no, of course everyone not. to be non-religious in the traditional sense, or, or the Haredi, or or whatever. We 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 you know or every single element of Israeli society is absolutely critical to to the the total the puzzle. Uh, things. Yeah, what, what what we need to work is not on the on those pieces. Pieces are great. It's it's the it's the structure that they fit into. It's the you know it's the box that they fit into. And you know, how can we? create um a way that people can appreciate each other they basically you know it's hakrat uh, atov you know uh, appreciation or valuing or uh uh kavod it's um well, how do we, uh, respect how do how do we respect one another how how do how do we look at the other person and say wow that person is doing something really important it's not what i'm doing if they're your, if they're they're your family if it's your yeah. family you can even mm -hmm. if they do something wrong Mm -hmm. You justify them anyway. Yeah, that's the thing. The only way, if we treat yeah. everyone, as you mentioned maybe Stein's or someone who said that that we're a family. If it's your family, so you're willing to justify no matter what they do all the time mm -hmm. because it's yours. Mm -hmm. So that's what we need. We need to feel like a family. Yeah. So look, I mean, God's way of doing it apparently is to stick us into a. Uh, uh, a uh, existential war with our enemies and then uh, you know we by definition are in a boat and if we don't all stick together we we sink so that, that, yeah. that, that you're right we don't want to have to keep coming back to this every time uh in order should to be to, smart to... enough after all these thousands of years to kind of get the okay like we read the book mm -hmm. we experienced seen, what seen happened the movie. we've seen the movie the movie grandpa told us exactly is there I can tell you so yeah. Is, is there, you, no, tell, tell me, yeah. is, you said Hakarat Tov, recognition of mm. good. Is there, shouldn't it be preceded by recognition of evil? Like, can can we at least agree that the evil is there's something egoistic inside each of us, this natural tendency to push the other, to place yourself above everyone else? It's natural, yeah. it's human nature. We were yeah. created this way, really, for, mm -hmm. for, for a purpose, to ex precisely to ensure this good friction that happens, this diversity, you need it. But mm -hmm. when you let it take over, that that's death. So can right. we can we get to a recognition of yeah. evil before? So, so, yes, Are we so the there? rabbis, Are we the rabbi, the rabbis I respect. You know, whenever um, some madman comes out, uh, some mad rabbi comes and says, you know, the reason that this particular tragedy took place was because, you know, the women weren't wearing long dresses, or because people were keeping Shabbat, or wherever it was. Um, you know, um, it's a bit it's a bit like you know on Yom Kippur uh, we beat our chests as we say al chait. Um, yeah. But these rabbis are beating some the, the person's chest next to them. You know, it's like the whole point about Yom Kippur is we beat our own chest. We say, you know, we're guilty. Well, the right. problems that are happening, we, we're responsible for. So when a tragedy happens, we need to look internally, not externally, and not blame everybody else, but actually work out what, how we can we can change. But um, of course, th that works for ourselves. Doesn't work for the next person if they're not doing it and they're blaming me. You know, it, 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 it's a difficult situation, but uh, I think that's a Jewish uh, thing to 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 try and work out what how I can be a better person. I, I, I want to maybe a, a three blitz questions, kind of, you yeah. know, because I feel like there's a lot to to dig with you, but uh, you know, it's uh, that's I mean that that's part of the you know this thing is that you suddenly discover another another you know another beautiful human there, and you want to just you know. <laughs> Um, so f f a couple of questions. Number one, uh, can you, uh, in a nutshell, you, you mentioned a very interesting approach to, uh, uh, I was saying, you know, to, to buying us time with respect to, uh, to the Arabs who live with the Palestinians, uh, who are, you know, outside the territories, inside the territories. How, and you, you, we heard you, you, you spoke about a few very interesting things. Can you give, uh, a, a little a short summary of the approach you think, uh, should be uh, taken uh, yep. to ensure, you know, some mode yep. of normalcy here. Uh, so, yeah, look, look, people say to me the whole time, I, you know, I, I say there can be peace with the uh, with our neighbors. People say you're mad. I say if if we were having this conversation in 1940s Germany, you would have said the same thing. And now look how Jews live in Germany very happily and in Austria as great citizens. Yeah, so, so um, you know, we go around in circles. But the fact of the matter are we know that after the Holocaust, we now have very good relationships with Germans and Austrians. So these these things are possible. Um, and actually, we can learn from the uh, from the denazification that took place in uh, Germany after the war, uh, the Marshall Plan. Um, what we need is very simple, is uh, a carrot and a stick. 
Okay, and if you look at the way that Israel has uh, dealt with uh, Palestinian neighbors, we've never ever tried uh, parenting 101, psychology 101, you know, carrot and a stick. Um, and uh, you know, given that a lot of them drive donkeys, you know, we should have seen it physically in front of us <laughs> walking down the street. But uh, a carrot and a stick, what do I mean? I think that there has to be a stick, meaning that obviously, uh, from Israel's perspective, we have to have a structure of the uh, Palestinian Authority in Gaza, which uh, will not enable them to attack us ever again. Um, and that can be done very easily. One could divide them into a little satellite uh, cities, um, which they basically are in already in the, in, in the West Bank. There are 10 right. cities anyway. Uh, Gaza could be five or so uh, cities as well. Um, and then the rest could be surrounded by mili Isra Israeli military, which pretty much is already. Yeah, and, and, that, and that's a pretty good um, secure situation for Israel. That's what I call the stick. But of course, by itself, um, it's not a solution because if you just did that uh, and left them to their own devices, they would become extremely radicalized. They'd have no work. They'd be stuck, you know, and, and bored. And if they're heavily funded by Arab nations or UNRWA or whatever it is, um, they'll spend the money on terror tunnels and weapons and training their kids to kill. Right. Um, so what you need to do is actually have this the carrot. The carrot is, um, you know, the jobs to work in Israel. You know, because not only do they want to earn 10,000 shekels a month, uh, you know, as builders in Israel, which uh, many of them do. Um, but um, we also need them to work as uh, builders in Israel. And we had 200,000 of them coming in every day from uh, the PA until October the 7th. And now it's almost zero. Um, so in order to bring them back in, I think we need to um, make their de-radicalization um, a condition of getting the, the jobs back. And in Gaza, the de-radicalization should be the condition before they can get the job permits to come into Israel. And actually, I think the combination of the stick, meaning, you know, demilitarized zone um, and the, the uh, radicalized um, and the carrot, which means that there's a very big incentive to come and work uh, in Israel. And actually, I, I think, you know, over time, it we shouldn't just be work permits. They should have travel permits. They should be able to go and sit on the beach in Tel Aviv. They should be able to fly out of um of Ben Gurion, uh, and then it will feel very much more like, you know, from the river to the sea, you know, in a positive sense that they'll have access to the country. Um, and Ramadi, I know that's... how long will it take? How long will it take to to change a, a you know, if you have kids who were raised until they're eighteen years old that Jews are evil and we need to kill them? So okay, okay, I agree. Let's 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 go along with your plan. You know, does it take two generations to to change it, or how long? So, so... So Seth, I'll ask you, I mean, go back to, to Germany. How long did it take before we could trust uh, German kids, German teenagers? Uh, was it the 50s or was it the 60s? I mean, it, it wasn't a long time. Uh, because if you have the right incentive, I mean, they were, they were trained, the Nazi kids were trained to hate Jews. Uh, they were trained in the SS, a lot of the people, you know, so it, it, it didn't take a huge amount of time. Before I want to I wanna ask them. a tougher question, because mm -hmm. I mean, Seth's question was a given and, and your answer is also, to some extent, yeah, maybe. Mm -hmm. The question is, more difficult because you see today in Germany and around Germany, you see a rise of anti-Semitism, as mm -hmm. as if as if you know this you know demilitarization and re-education and reinvestment and let's bring him up to standard and give him makes make everyone feel good you know materially that in itself was not enough. It's not enough. You see it around the world. And so the yeah. question to you is, uh, you know, is it enough to simply try to? You know, carrot and stick. That sounds like a very material solution. It's a start. It's a start. I, no, I, I'm not. I'm not saying. Yeah. I'm, I'm asking. And you said, parent. You know, education one on one. There's another big education one on one aspect, which is uh, teach by example. Mm -hmm. So yes, you have to correct the situation. You know, stop fighting. Put. You know, you put. You're here. You're there. If you behave, you misbehave. That's a good starting point. But at the end of the day, kids learn most from from example. Right from right. looking, it's not even what you say to them. You can say it a million times, but if you do, if you behave badly, that's what they pick up on, right? So the question is: Is this something that we need to maybe show as an example? Is the material example not enough? Because I don't see it working elsewhere. By the way, you know, it worked for a while, but mm -hmm. it, it wasn't a bulletproof plan. I'm concerned I, you're going to do it again yeah. in 30 years. We're going to have another October seventh. I, I, look, I don't know so much about Germany. I, I, I was in Vienna after October the seventh uh, right. as, as an envoy to from the Foreign Office to visit the government there, whatever. And and you know, I can tell you about Austria, which probably may, may not be that different. Um, 
that the anti-Semitism was coming from the Muslims um, that they brought in the immigrants. And the government itself cracked down dramatically on free Palestine marches. It's probably the toughest uh, environment for them uh, in Europe. So, um, so actually, one could argue that it's worked extremely well. The uh, you know the denazification. It's just that the people, uh, for other reasons, brought in Arab workers. And but there's always another immigrants. reason. That's the pr- the problem. Is there's always another reason that it doesn't mm-hmm. matter what we do, it'll right. show up as Greek, it'll show up as Persian, it'll show up as Roman, right. it'll show up as Russian, it'll show up as Polish, it'll mm-hmm. show up as Spanish. That's mm-hmm. the problem. It'll mm-hmm. always morph until we. Um, no, I mean, I think I think that uh, I, I'm really inspired. I I love your energy too. It's not just like what you're saying. Your your eyes are smiling the whole time we're here. It's like a very you're like a very special person, and we talk to a lot of people, a lot of great people. Um, but I feel like you know, and, and maybe we're artificially pushing it at the end here, uh, as as maybe our time is running down. That. Um, like all these are great solutions on the ground. A lot of people have great solutions on the ground. And Leo and I are like always aiming towards the sky, like always aiming towards this like final Jewish ideal of all people living in harmony together. And, uh, you know, all as one man, like you quote, you know, quoted Rashi before as one man with one heart. Um, like this, this is, is, um, It's beyond. It's it's not a normal approach, right? We don't. We, we almost never hear people like talking about this part of it. Like, there's a lot of things that must be done on the ground, and we agree. We're not naive about that, but we want to now give a few minutes, if possible, about about like the goal of it all. Like, where are we going with all this? Is it just so we can shop at the shuk together? I mean, is that what it's all about? I mean, is that what this whole all these thousands of years was all about just so that, you know, our kids could play soccer on the same team, you know? Okay. I, I, so I would, I would again refer to my book, uh, which is uh, transforming the world available on Amazon. Um, but uh, I have a chapter on Israel at the end. And I, and what I say, I'll, I'll paraphrase is that, you know, uh, the whole book is about how Jews have an ob- uh, objective of creating Shalom in the world, right? Exactly what we're talking about this framework of uh you know that that other people's other everyone can fit into that is our job we're creating the white space around you know that everyone else can plug into um so then i said in the book is saying so israel's an interesting case in point because if we're the people of shalom why did god give us this country which is the most contentious country in the history of mankind it's been taken over by Mm -hmm. 30 empires over the last three and a half thousand years it's uh, exactly in the middle of east and west, north and south, and it has to be an essential part, apparently, of every other every empire. So it's been the most war-ridden uh, region in the history of mankind. So why mm-hmm. did God give us Switzerland? Uh, you know, because then you know that would have been a good place for shalom. And I, and, and the answer I give is, um, I think that um, if our objective is to create shalom in the world, right? God gave us the most complicated uh, case. Why? And I think you you said this yourself earlier. Because if we can solve it in Israel and the Middle East, then we can solve you know, that. Then the, whatever we whatever mm-hmm. solution we have will be a template for shalom that could be rolled out across the whole uh, world. And I honestly think that you know, as a starting point, um, this type of solution we're talking about, you know, parenting one hundred and one, the character stick. Um, could be uh, implemented here quite easily, particularly in this current situation where we have to find a solution anyway. Um, and when it works, um, it could be easily rolled out to um, Syria and Lebanon, eventually to Iran, uh, Iraq. You know, and I, th- I think the people in those countries will be, will be begging for it when they see the prosperity and the sort of you know, the, 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 the the level of shalom and, and human rights and democracy that can spread from it. I think that people will be will be demanding it. Um, so this is something that can spread. And I think if you want, you want to talk about a, a purpose for the Jewish state, well, that would be a good start. I don't know how, how many years that will take. That that keeps us going for the next you know hundred years or so. Um, and and, and spread this. Yeah, spread, spread, spread. So in other words, to find a real startup a, a, nation. Yeah, startup nation. Find find an optimal solution and then to spread it. Um, and and um, yeah, beautiful. I. I want to just 
go one step deeper with your permission. Uh, we're coming up to the uh, anniversary to to last year's events, and, and I'm sure for you, it's it's looking back, it's hard to imagine that uh, how your life changed uh, less, you know, almost a year ago uh, when you lost your wife and, and daughters. And um, I'm I'm I remember I actually remember this this event. And I think no less three, four days after it happened, you you came out with this uh, call for unity. Uh, you know, you 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 were there, and uh, you know Israelis need to be united. You know, I, my question to you is maybe you can you can just a little bit for people who can't imagine what what someone you know in your place goes through, uh, but. Where, where did it come from? Where, where, where did, where did this, uh, this, this, you know, this feeling to call for unity after such a such an, an experience, such a horrible experience, a horrible personal experience? Where did this feeling come from? The the power for it uh, came from, and and it's a, it's, a, it's a very good question. I I can't really tell you, but I can tell you something that <clears throat> you know when you go through such a tragedy, um, your mind is sort of cleared. Uh, from a lot of the noise, um, I'm sure other people have said this before, that, um, you know, all the rubbish that you deal with on a day to day basis, all the hatred that you have of other people, and all these sort of the noise that uh, the white noise that takes place in, in your mind all the time, and you may not be aware of it, gets deleted. Um, and suddenly you see life in a complete clarity, because, you know, everything has been brought down to a crisis. And I think, you know, maybe it's a survival instinct, an evolutionary thing, maybe it's a God-given gift, I don't know what it, what it is, but you suddenly see with, with clear light. Um, uh, you know, one of the, the strange things that happened during the Shiva, uh, because we had many, many visitors, um, and I was telling people that before the Shiva, uh, before this, this uh, crisis, um, I had about four people who I wouldn't speak to, right? Every you got people you're broigus with, you know, you can't bear to to, to speak to yeah. them. Um, so, you know, something I did or something they did to me, whatever it was, I can't remember. But if you see them in the supermarket, you know, you're shopping for the cucumbers, um, and all you see them are the cucumbers, you're doing the oranges, and when they turn around, you do that. You don't want to bump into them, you don't want to have to look at them in the face. And and I had four people like that. And I'll tell you something, when this happened, all four of them came to the Shiva and all they wanted from me was a hug. And all I wanted to do was to give them a hug. Um, and I can explain to you why, because I didn't have any capacity for anger. And just, you know, having them, you know, in, in, in this status, even though they weren't there, um, it, it, I, I, you know, it was, it was, it was just taking energy away from me, which I need, I desperately needed. So when they came to the shiver and I was able to hug them and just say, you know, it's all forgotten. Um, it was a tremendous relief for me. And I think they must've felt the same way because they came, um, they must have felt guilty, whatever, for whatever reason, you know, so, and it was cleansing for them. Um, and it was just an eye opener because, you know, these are the people who I couldn't stand. They couldn't stand me. And suddenly, you know, they were like, it was most important for me to actually give them a hug. So, um, Maybe it's true that those people who we can't stand in life, who, who really annoy us the most, are the people that we most need to give a hug, and they most need a hug from us. So I, I don't know if that, that plays into um, what, what we've been talking I, about. I, no, I mean, it's, it's beautiful. I, I was about to ask if you have any any advice, just suggestion for people who, you know, obviously we don't want people to go through a horrible tragedy to reach this moment of clarity, which seems like it's guiding you ever since, uh, you know, mm -hmm. what... What's what's your advice? You know, my, my advice, to be honest, uh, and and it you know, sounds I, I'm, I'm not in a negative sense, but I, I I said to people, you know, if you feel you have a purpose that you're not fulfilling, go out and fulfill it now. Because if you don't, and if it happens to be the purpose you're meant to be fulfilling, you know, God will find ways of making it happen, and it won't be pleasant. And better to not get it get to that point. Um, so my advice would be, you know, if you have the capability, and I think most people do have a capability to do something uh, in their lives that's great, you know, that's greater than what they're currently doing. So think about it and do it. You know, don't put it off um, because for that you were created.
Um, typically, this is where we end the show. Uh, <laughs> okay. uh, I'd love for you to um, just do us this one last uh, favor, and um, when, before we say our goodbyes, uh, to re- read us a little quote that I found for uh, for us. After everything we discussed, we talked about peace. This is from Lekutei Etzot. It's called The Valley of Peace. If you can read it for us, and then we'll we'll send you off uh, with a great deal of respect, appreciation, um, love, and Thank gratitude. Thank you. I enjoyed our chat. Okay, the essence of peace is to connect two opposites, hence your ideas will frighten you. If you see a person whose opinion is completely opposite of yours, and you think that it's impossible to keep peace with him, and also when you see two people who are completely opposite of each other, do not say that it's impossible to the contrary. This is the essence of peace, to try to make peace between two opposites. Beautiful. Rabbi D. Thank Leo, Leo, thanks so much. Seth. Thank you. Thank you Thank you much. so much for being with us, for uh, coming to the Jew Function. Big hug. Yes, a big hug. Uh, we're, uh, you know, you're in our circle, as we tell everyone who comes here, that's it. Uh, we're stuck for life. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, right. And, uh, Success you know, we'll, with everything. Thank yes. You. Good luck for you. Your book is available on Amazon. It's called Transforming the World, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, we'll put a link there in the in the description. Okay. And uh, yes, and, and we'll continue to push towards our purpose, individual and hopefully collective purpose as well. And, you know, this is the Jew function. Uh, like, comment, subscribe, uh, leave a donation. Nobody has donated anything to us. So <laughs> if, you, if you feel inclined, you know, now is a great time uh, just so we can get the word out. And we'll see everyone next week. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.